My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, we're getting the pints in when there's trouble at Grog's. We are here for Trouble at Grog's. Tom, I recently sat down with the creator of Barkeep on the Borderlands, W.F. Smith, who goes by Warren in person, and we talked about Trouble at Grog's. And for the expert delve, we talked about running or creating a fun tavern-based session. So shall we go take a listen? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay, hello, Warren. Hey. All right, so we are here talking about trouble at Grog's, and we are going to do so, as we always do, by beginning with our first segment, The Basic Crawl. Trouble at Grog's is a mystery scenario slash adventure for first-level characters. It was written by Grant and David Boucher, features artwork by Daniel Holm, and cartography by Diesel. It was published in 1987 in Dungeon Magazine number 4. Now, before we go much further, I will put a big spoiler warning on this episode for Trouble at Grog's. This podcast is always a spoilers podcast, but it's something you want to be particularly mindful of here, especially if you're going to be a player in this module at some point, because so much of the fun of it, I think, hangs on the module's central mystery. But with that said, this is directly from the text. Dagger Rock has always been a quiet, peaceful town, that is, until recently. Six months ago, a half-ogre named Grog decided to settle down here and build his now-famous Happy Half-Ogre Inn and Tavern. Grog's is known for its food, hospitality, and above all, its extremely low prices. Grog's doesn't discriminate in the least and has therefore become a meeting place for half-breeds, adventurers, and other seedy sorts. At first, most people in the town appreciated the new business and welcomed Grog and his friends with open arms. However, a recent crime wave has struck Dagger Rock, and there is growing concern that Grog or the company he keeps is responsible. Many wild rumors are floating around town, and opposition to the newcomers is becoming greater by the day. A town council meeting has been called for one week after the party arrives, to decide the fate of Grog's establishment. The module begins with that introduction, as well as a section for dungeon masters about how to set up the scenario. We'll then have a short section about the village of Dagger Rock, the truth of what is actually going on with the crime wave, which is that a rival tavern owner is trying to frame Grog for the incident so that the town kicks him out at an upcoming meeting, and also half-ogres. Following that is a day-by-day summary of events that will take place in the module, kicking off that the night the characters arrive in Dagger Rock. The basic thrust of it is that the player characters will be investigating the crime wave, trying to figure out what's really going on, and presenting their findings to the town meeting, hopefully saving Grog from being cast out. Then we have a section with rumors, most of which are false. The bulk of the text is taken up with maps and encounter keys for the town of Daggerfall itself, and important places within it. Importantly, the Happy Half-Ogre Inn and Tavern, aka Grog's, which has about 25 keyed locations. The town of Dagger Rock, with a number of businesses and homes detailed. The Guard Station and Jail, with its seven keyed locations the Hearthfire Inn, with 14 keyed locations, Bearclaw Keep, the home of the Bearclaw family, the patriarch of which is Grog's friend and former adventuring party companion. There are a number of keyed locations here as well. Dagger Rock Tavern, the business and home of the bad guy, Yuri Kinneron, with nine keyed locations. The actual Dagger Rock, a rock formation that looks like a dagger stuck in a river with its own secrets, and a series of underground tunnels. The module ends with a short section on concluding the quest. Okay, bona fides. Warren, I ran this in Dungeon World over the course of several sessions about eight years ago, so it's been a minute. We concluded the basic mystery actually fairly quickly, but then spent some time just kind of getting wrapped up in the various mysteries and dramas in Dagger Rock. What's your familiarity with this? I've not actually run it, but I I read it a few years back. One of my fellow bloggers, Brent at the Glassbird Games blog, he said it was his favorite adventure, so I was obviously tantalized just by the fact that it was a social adventure and a fairly old one at that, and that's always something interesting. I mean, interested in things that are not quite as sword and sorcery and more socializing heavy, so it was something that I wanted to look into. Fantastic. Well, let's just kick off with things we liked about the module. I usually like to start with presentation things. I think the maps here are really terrific. Like, even if you don't use this module as written, you should definitely swipe these for some other game. 
I definitely agree, especially if you're running any sort of taverns. There are three different taverns, each one of kind of varying sizes. Grog's yeah, is yeah. the largest. So if you're running any, just pull one of the three, and, and that's pretty much all the variety you need for, for taverns. We should talk about the art, though. I think the art is just, it's okay from a technical standpoint. I did find it to be quite charming, though. What were your thoughts on the art? It wasn't, you know, standout in terms of the quality. I did find it interesting that it had kind of positive fat person representation, I say, as kind of a fat person myself, from Matilda to Jack and Mabel Whittem, some of which are, are not as positive characters, but all kind of are just presented as like, it's not grotesque and that they're, they're large. Yeah, it's just like yeah. they're jolly and, you know, yeah. it's good representation for the 80s, especially. One thing I thought was funny about the art was, all the characters look like they posed for it. Yes. <laughs> Every illustration looks like the characters sat and put their hands on, you know, on, on the table for the artists. The, yeah, the these artists are their profile them. pictures yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty great. Okay. Anything else from a presentation standpoint that you found worth mentioning? Um, the layout's nice and readable. I mean, it's it's pretty standard for what you'd expect from Dungeon Magazine. It's a Dungeon but, Magazine yeah. layout, yeah. <laughs> Let's get to more of the substance here then. And I have to say... I really love this module a lot. This is really, really fun. I would say that the basic mystery is just, it's good, it's serviceable. It can actually be resolved pretty easily, I find. But the setting of Dagger Rock, and in particular Grog's Tavern, is fantastic. Just at a high level, what do you think of it? I agree that the mystery is kind of take it or leave it, but it seems like such a good starting town and something that I could really see players glomming onto is like, here's our home base. We're really going to invest a lot of the entire campaign into this. It's clearly very detailed. My guess is that the authors probably built this up in their own campaigns. Yes. Yeah. I had that exact same feeling. There's there's basically like kind of two central characters in the setting. Grog, this half-ogre, and then this other guy, Sidden Bearclaw, I believe his name is. Right. And I got the distinct impression that that was the Boucher's characters from their campaign i don't know i don't know if that's true but didn't you think it's, it that? seemed like it because yeah, it mentioned that yeah. they were previous and they clearly had a lot of history like you know their named items and stuff like that so it's clearly they had like a lot of background and a lot of the world building was for those guys the characters were like they were fellow adventuring party members before mm-hmm. they settled down in dagger rock I, I don't know i would love to know i don't know how to get in touch with the authors of this because <laughs> it's been so long i have no idea how to get in touch with them but i really want to know if these were their characters i appreciate that from just a actually from this is something of a tangent but i really appreciate it from a sort of design and game writing standpoint because pretty much everything that goes into my games is something taken directly from like one of the campaigns of something i've i've, I've run um so you know a, a character here a setting there remixed for some other thing you know so i really kind of appreciate that and i think it helps this perspective makes the module if it's true feel really textured really lived in and i think that was what really appealed to me the it all kind of starts for me with the introduction to Grog's Tavern. There's a boxed text portion uh, that you read to players, and I think it is probably one of the best pieces of such text that you'll find in a module. It paints such a vivid picture of this tavern. It makes it seem so fun, like you immediately want to interact with it. I mean, it was oh, so good. All that kind of depth and complexity it really adds to not just the mystery of who's trying to frame Grog, but also just the mystery of the world. Like, Things like Dagger Rock itself, there's just a side quest that's not important for the the main thrust of the module of unlocking mm. the secrets therein. You know, a lot of things of who built this, why, and, and background stuff that is hidden and just kind of larger mysteries at play. Well, that was what we found when we played it, too. I mean, this has been, it's been a long time since I've run this, but I remember we knocked out the basic mystery really quickly. It's not a hard mystery. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's really easy to resolve, actually. And in defense of the the module writers, it, they say it's for first level characters, right? This is like an introduction kind of thing, right? But you're right. There's so much stuff to do in Dagger Rock. So many little little side quests, so many little other mysteries, so many like really cool characters. The, the texture for these characters is, it's off the charts. Like I said, you've got that really, really great introduction to Grogs itself, which really has the feeling of a big like Quentin Tarantino set piece, you know, like when you're when the camera is kind of roving through Jack Rabbit Slims or the House of Blue Leaves or whatever, right? It's kind of got that vibe the way it's presented, and then you just meet all these characters who, where details are included that just make them feel quite real, not like 
white wolf or vampire the masquerade <laughs> level of detail yeah, right gameable like just a, details just gameable like just enough yeah yeah one of the grog's employees is a former slave who keeps his slave chains above his bed to remind him of his past and his present good fortune i just love that detail it was such a you instantly like understood that character right which is so great and also just good connections between npcs like that character you know it talks about how he has all these fine clothes and later you talk about the tailor and he mentions that that's a great customer of his so he's kind of more positively inclined. yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like th- those little connections, mm-hmm. it just really brings the, the village to life. Yeah, it really does. You mentioned already the fact that, the, you know, there are like named weapons hanging on the wall of the tavern, which kind of speaks to the history of these characters. Grog himself is really quite a compelling character, this half-ogre. He's immediately sympathetic, which is important for the players wanting to do the mystery. And one of the ways he's, in my mind, like completely immediately sympathetic is He feels so lucky to have just survived his adventuring life, and he just wants to share good cheer with people to the point where he only makes enough money to kind of get by, you know? And how can you not love that, everybody? You know, how can you not love Grog? Yeah, it's always reminding you his cheap yeah. prices versus everybody yeah, else's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always like, isn't Grog a good guy? And he is a good guy. <laughs> you know, so I love all that. We kind of talked about this, but like, there's so many other like little things to get wrapped up in. I love the little side schemes and cons going on. I know you have, I know you have a note about the healing potion scheme, which is really, really good. For context, there's a cleric in Grog's Tavern who is posing as a healing potion merchant but it's just colored alcohol. And what he does is he'll cast cure wounds on the person by wiping off the excess potion from their chin. And they see, oh, wow, the potion worked. And he'll take money for pre-orders, but then they'll take their money and, and leave. And that's just like such yes. a good little con that you can really you can is. pluck that NPC out and put it anywhere mm-hmm. and it works. Yeah. Along a similar vein, early on in the module, they introduce this sort of like town drunk character, right? And they talk about how he's, you know, just the town drunk and every village has a town drunk, right? Well, then you later learn that this town drunk works for the bad guy and he just happens to pass out outside of windows so he can eavesdrop on the bad guy's enemies. Little details like that just really make this whole setting come alive. And like you said, they connect up with other characters, but it's all presented in a way that's very manageable. It it never feels too overwhelming. Just so good. One thing I do want to call out, sticking with this idea of like, it's a very textured, lived in setting. This tavern, Grog's, and uh, which is the central one, there are three. It has an adventurer's suite and I kind of love this because it's like a special room that is specifically for adventuring parties. And what I love about that is it takes into account the types of amenities that such groups would want. It's kind of like a half conference room, half storage. Yeah, it mentions as a large table for casting detect magic items. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I kind of like that. And, and, and again, it kind of speaks to like Grog and Bear Claw's history and kind of how they got there. And so it all just kind of makes it feel really, really real. There's so much cool stuff here to talk about. Anything else you want to highlight? Yeah, another aspect is just the town meeting itself, which isn't detailed fully. You know, obviously, that's kind of the conclusion. But anytime there's like town meetings and elections, and there's also a mayoral election kind of hinted at throughout. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of thing that a lot of times my players will glom onto as being like, oh, we want to get involved in that. And any, you know, if there's a trial, if there's anything like that, players are going to want to be able to like have an opportunity to role play. That's a great aspect of it. This actually it kind of dovetails nicely with something I wanted to say about this, which is I was thinking about this in the context of, okay, it was written for first level adventurers. And in a lot of cases, it's probably going to be people who are brand new to the hobby in general. It's going to be a lot of people who've never played before, if this is their first character, their first level character. And I really love this as an introduction to fantasy adventure gaming, because I think it shows, I I think that social side is actually a little easier for new gamers to get into. This is something that I've discovered in my own publications, which is that a lot of people who are sort of newer to the hobby, they actually are surprisingly good at the social stuff more than you would think, because it's the closest to sort of just what we do in our everyday lives. And so I kind of like that as a sort of entree into like what this hobby can be and kind of what you do. But it also still has just enough adventure bits, has just enough mystery stuff. Like you mentioned the actual dagger rock, this dagger shaped rock structure in the stream. There's like a really cool mystery connected to that that the players can discover. And so Trouble at Grogs, it really feels like a great, great starting scenario for new or old role players. Like this is just such a cool way to say, look how fun this 
hobby can be you know that was my vibe that was the vibe i got from it anyway no definitely it shows kind of there's possibilities here besides just battling skeletons there is a part where they say you can't battle skeletons but it's not there's really no combat explicitly in this it's only ever really implied yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I mean, I think there are some some rats in the, yeah. in the cave somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you know, it's it's you know, nineteen eighty seven. What are you gonna do? Lots of stuff to do. Uh, the rumors section, excellent. I love the rumors section. It's not long enough, in my opinion. I would have loved like ten more rumors that, along these lines. They're very well written. They're fun. They have some really fun misdirects in there because they're mostly false rumors, but they have just enough shade of the truth to make players think they might be true or to mislead you in some fun way. And I think that's what a good rumor table does. This is, I, I, it's not a table. It's more just like a, a few paragraphs, but really, really love that. Just overall, I was super happy with this module. I had a really, really fun time revisiting it. Yeah, I'd love to run at some point. Why don't we go on to some questions we had then about the module? I have a few. My first is not really a question. It's more just a quick observation uh, that this module was written in 1987 and it doesn't necessarily talk about species and half species in the same way we would in 2024. The language is slightly problematic, I would say. But I will say on the substance, I actually think it's mostly pretty good. It challenges the idea that some species are inherently good or inherently evil in some interesting ways. For 1987, I think the characters are are pretty well written and nuanced in this regard. What do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. It's something you always have to address in these old modules, you know? Yeah, I mean, the the language that the narrators use, yeah, definitely not kind of up to our modern standards. But in terms of the content, it's anti-racist and that that's yeah. kind of the, the central tension in the town. There are even kind of NPCs who are otherwise disconnected from the mystery but kind of have these prejudices. And obviously the way that the module itself is written is – in favor of Grog and his friends and kind of against the people who are more bigoted towards them. So for 1987, kind of grading on a curve, it is really interesting. Another in that same vein, I'm not sure if this is me reading into it, but I feel like Grog might also be kind of early queer representation. Just there's a throwaway line. Yes, I got a little of that too. Yeah, yeah, of him being a confirmed bachelor when it's talking about him and uh, his cook. So that might be, again, kind of reading into it, but I think that's kind of a cool thing of yeah, this half-orc former adventure also being queer in this small town. Yeah, no, I, I kind of picked up on that a little bit, too. I, I always try to be careful about not reading into what is, at the very least, a platonic relationship between two male characters as being a romantic one, because I think there's, there should be space for like healthy, vibrant platonic relationships between male characters. But I did kind of get... You could definitely tell that there's love of some sort between Bear Claw and Grog, right? Like it's there. Like they, there's a there's an affection there, right? Even if it's not romantic or physical in some other way, like it's very, I don't know, the relationship. It's charming. Like it's you, you, you're into it. You can feel on the page that these characters like really, really care about each other, and I think that's pretty cool. It's definitely more than surface level, and yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. Some other things I had. Oh comeliness is mentioned as a stat i don't remember comeliness being a stat i, I was in a one e player to be fair but i was that a thing do you remember that being a thing i think that was added kind of ancillarily to ad um <laughs> yeah. though kind of i'm not sure if this is too much of a tangent but it also kind of ties back to the the original proto D that dave arneson ran it had sex specifically like sexual prowess as a stat oh, so okay. there's always been nerds yeah. trying to put that into the stats yeah. i don't i think it's always fallen out and yeah yeah for good reason probably for the best yeah yeah i know i thought that was interesting it is funny okay so i do think that this in this module there's something of a weird tension in the fact that players are trying to solve or get to the truth of a crime spree while possibly committing crimes themselves because you're told in all the locations where the inhabitants valuables are at where so you can presumably steal them <laughs> right? so i don't know what has to be asked there or said but i just thought it was interesting classic D adventure like keep on the borderlands it's like are we supposed to steal everything in the keep it's yeah like, maybe. Like, i mean you're, you're telling <laughs> us about it so that means we should be able to take it i don't know did you have any questions about this yeah one of my questions just in terms of how like richly detailed it is the one glaring exception of that is the bakery where it just has a line that says the DM should create a typical bakery, baker and his family, if necessary. And 
that just felt so out of place with how detailed yeah. everything else was. I assume it was like cut for time kind of it's thing. For space. Yeah. Yeah. For space. yeah. I, I, th- that was the editor saying, Oh, I, I, I can't make this column fit here if we yeah. don't cut something down. So they I just love to know who the baker is and what, what I know. Yeah. Was, we know nothing yeah. about the baker. I, I guess that's the, that's the negative space for him that we get to fill in as the DM. So. Right. Okay. Fantastic. With all that said, let's go to the chain lightning round. Ah. Warren. Criminal justice is harsh in the setting. Um, Grog's going to be kicked out of town if the plot is not uncovered. But it also says if you prove the Yuri, the bad guys behind it, he'll be immediately exiled if still alive, which I thought was a little harsh. Mm -hmm. These Dungeon Magazine modules always contain funny little blurbs about the authors, and I really like this one. Grant is now an English major with a minor in physics. His favorite hobby is writing to magazine editors who fail to write back. David still likes half ogres and looks forward to being paid for this module. The adventure lacks any necessary or implied combat other than rats, but the authors are aware of this, and they do have kind of a funny note in the graveyard saying, If the party's whining for some combat and experience points, throw in a few of the town's ancestors, i.e. skeletons. The sign outside of Grog's reads, Grog's Happy Half-Ogre Inn and Tavern, and a smaller sign beneath it reads, Half-Breeds Welcome. Someone has tried very hard to carve the letters U-N before the word welcome in the lower sign, but there are signs of a vigorous attempt to remove the additional letters. Good for you, Dagger Rock. This was obviously written before Pokemon, but I can't help noting the similarity between two of the henchmen who are a married evil elf couple and their pet cat familiar. Very Team Rocket coded to me. <laughs> Love it. Finally, the cellar at the Green Grape Wine and Spirit Shop is protected by a pair of vicious war dogs called Buttercup and Cream Puff. Let's go to the next segment. Hi listeners, Jason here. If you're enjoying this podcast, you should support it and everything we do in the gauntlet by joining us on Patreon. We have three pledge tiers available for new supporters in 2024. The $2 pledge is a great way of saying thank you for everything we do, and it goes a long way toward helping us make this show. You also get some perks on our Discord, such as a special name badge showing you're on the team and access to Patreon-exclusive channels. At $7, you get early access to Gauntlet publications, as well as access to a number of exclusive releases. In recent weeks, the $7 feed has featured Cut to Christmas, a new mystery for public access, Places in the Wild, which are standalone adventure sets for Trophy Gold, Sweet Jolly Crunch Tooth, a new playbook for the Silt vs. role-playing game, Squatch Your Step, a new mystery for Brindlewood Bay, and much more. And we have a ton of new releases heading to the feed in 2024, including brand new games, and scenarios and support material for existing games. Finally, at the $10 level, in addition to all the aforementioned stuff, you will receive a monthly invite to a special two-hour coffee chat hosted by me, where you and other $10 patrons can chat about the games you're running, talk about game design, and just generally hang out with a fine group of like-minded people. So head over to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet and pledge today. If you can't pledge to Patreon right now, there are other ways of helping us out, such as leaving a five-star review on this podcast or on one of our drive through RPG pages. No matter how you help us, please know that we appreciate it and we're delighted you've decided to go on this journey with us. Take care. Our next segment is the Expert Delve. For today's Expert Delve, we are talking about running a fun tavern scenario. I can't think of a better guest to have for this topic than you, Warren, creator of Barkeep on the Borderlands. I actually kind of think, perhaps ironically, that even though people like to complain about the fact that there's this trope of you all meet in a tavern, I actually think a good tavern or inn scenario can be like among the most memorable in your campaign. I've run tavern sessions that my playgroups years later still talk about. They never talk about the fucking wizard tower. They always talk about that one like rollicking tavern session, you know? So I thought it would be fun to dive into why we think tavern sessions can be so enjoyable and how we can present them or even write them to make them more enjoyable. What are your thoughts just at a high level about making a fun tavern session? In terms of why they're so enjoyable, I think you hit on it earlier, talking about how people coming to the hobby, what they are already familiar with, even if they don't know anything about fighting skeletons, is socializing. Even if you've not been to a bar, you kind of know what it's like to be hobnobbing with a group of people. So Mm -hmm. what my goal always is with tavern scenarios is basically 
the cantina scene and the original Star Wars. That's kind of my yes, what I yeah. aspire to. It's Prince, it's Prince, yeah, Prince and Pony. Right? Pony. There's, Prince there's so many good and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so many good yeah, in, in yeah. fantasy and sci-fi kind of tavern scenes, or even like just kind of like party scenes, because it's a good time for yeah. mixing up the characters. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. We all have like good memories of in our personal lives of, of you know settings like that and you know parties and, and bars and things like that. But also like from fiction, you know, like you said, I, I do still have good memories of the early inn and tavern scenes in the Dragonlance books. I don't know if you've ever read the Dragonlance books, but but the very beginning of those are kind of set in this tavern and inn. And I just and I still think about those scenes. You know, I think that. A fun, rollicking tavern session to some degree, you know, it's, it's what a lot of people are here for, you know, it's kind of what they really want to do. The dungeon is like the, the opportunity, you know, it's, it's, it's the vehicle to, to get you to the celebration. I know I think a lot of people think of it that way. I don't think I do personally, necessarily. I, I like nasty, grotty, gross dungeons <laughs> and monsters and stuff, but, 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 but I kind of get it. So if I had to think about like what makes a tavern scenario or session really good i think it's important that the characters have something to do while they're there i don't think it's enough to just say okay we're having a party here's a bunch of cool characters go wander around and have fun i actually think it helps a lot if there is still something that the characters are trying to do i think that's just a good rule of thumb in role-playing games in general i think a lot of the late aughts and early 2010s story games, for example, a lot of them fell down because they would have these like really great premises and scenarios, but there's never anything for the characters to do. Like it was never like always clear, like what the character should be doing at any given moment. And I think that kind of applies in a tavern scenario. I think it helps if you wrap all this fun, rollicking environment, this party environment in a task. Absolutely agree. It's it's not enough to just have interesting patrons and, and bartenders in the bar, which is definitely like the first step. But the second step is connecting it in some way to the players. Like if you think about those key cantina scenes in Star Wars, you know, they're there and they're looking for a pilot to take them out. At the same time, they're being like accosted by people at the bar who say they don't like them. Mm -hmm. Grogs is a good example because as soon as they come in, he enlists them in this big conspiracy that he's being a victim of. So something that not only Grog is an interesting character himself, but also pulling you in, you know, Hansel is an interesting character, but They're doing something in the bar and it interacts in some way with the characters because the characters, of course, the main character of the fiction and of the game. So find some way to draw them and connect them to these interesting characters. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, I think because a tavern has a fairly limited geographic scope, even the surrounding village and town, it's a fairly limited scope as compared to, say, a mountain pass, an abandoned castle, a cave system. I think because of that, it's really important that these settings have texture and detail. In an abandoned castle, you can kind of get away with saying a couple of cool details about this giant throne room your characters just wandered into. But I think in a tavern, because you've got such a limited space physically for the characters to explore, I think that texture is really important. For one thing, there just needs to be things for the the players to interact with, whether it be lots of different types of characters or weird objects or whatever. But also, I just think it helps to make it equally interesting to an abandoned haunted castle. You have this note about the bar should be toyetic. I love that word, toyetic. Yeah, I I think of that. I think that's really great. Not only for taverns, but for pretty much any kind of adventure location you're designing, toyetic, which I think of as like, be like a child's playset. you know, lots of little Mm -hmm. knobs and things to spin and little trap doors. And like you're saying, with bars where it is, you rely less on just a common knowledge. It's nice to have a few just things to interact with. Like if you describe like a big bubbling pot of stew in the center or a wet floor that hasn't been mopped or a mouse scurrying about that's obviously like looking for food or a serving person carrying a big knife. All of these just kind of spark ideas without like particular solutions, which is important in the players. So they're thinking, oh, if I get in a fight, maybe I can push them down the wet yeah. floor and, and get them into the, the hot oh, pot. Yeah, yeah. Little knobs and stuff to play with. Very toyetic to me. Yeah, yeah. I love that word. I've, I don't think I've ever actually heard that word before. So I really loved it. It really captures an idea. What I'm calling texture, I think toyetic is a good way of putting it because you're right. Creating like an almost like a playset type environment, I think can really help with something like a tavern where it may not always be clear to some players what is there to do besides just drink you know and and listen to the bard play music right like they may need some things to interact with you know obviously it's not just a like a mandate i think it's actually part of the fun as the gm 
to create a space that feels like a living, breathing place. You know, it's the sights, it's the smells, it's the sounds. Of course, those things are very important. It's also the people, though. What are people like? What sorts of customs do they observe? What do they like on the menu? I think that tells you something about the people. What are your thoughts about the people in a tavern? That's the key thing. Nobody's going to the tavern, at least in fantasy games, just because the layout is really nice, because that's not something you're experiencing. What you're really experiencing is the people and like, if you want your characters to be regulars at this tavern, if they really grow attached to the bar staff, that is the way to do it. And so having people who are interesting, sympathetic, have issues that the players can help with or issues that the players have that they can help with, mm-hmm. any of that that ties the characters in the bar with the characters they're playing is the key to making the bar really stand out and be something central for the campaign. You know, I think if you're running like a tavern module, like something that's already written, I think you can do a lot worse than going through that module and highlighting like motivations of characters. Because sometimes in all the blocks of text, basic things like that can get lost. What does this character even want? What do they do? What's going to motivate them? Because that tells you so many things. If you just know in almost like a one sentence way, what motivates this character, you immediately know how they respond to things. Like when the characters walk up to them and talk to them, you immediately have some things you can grab onto to cause trouble in the scene or to um, get the character's attention or what have you. If you're writing a scenario, obviously the considerations are a little bit different there. If you're somewhere in the middle, like you are just sort of preparing a session as as a GM, you're not trying to write a whole module, but you are trying to prepare like a fun tavern session for your players. I think that there are some easy, small things you can do to sort of add this texture to it in a way that is not going to create a huge amount of work. Here I will dig out my old 731 adventure creation advice right from yesteryear i don't totally subscribe to this anymore but i think there's something still useful there which is you can't go wrong ever by creating like seven things maybe four really cool characters a couple of cool things in the tavern and maybe one thing outside of the tavern that can be interacted with three descriptive details for each of those seven things and then one way that you can embody it or express it at the table I've talked about that a million times on the show in the past, but I think that that's one way you can quickly get to a nice serviceable thing that is maybe not completely written out in module detail, but at least is enough for you to grab onto as a GM and and play around with it. Lately, meaning the last few years or so, my approach would be to actually put it on the players. (laughs) Um, I'm very much a, how can I get the players to tell me about this tavern? Something that we did in one of our publications, the Silt vs. Role-Playing Game, I don't think I've ever talked about it on the show before, but I'm not going to go into what what it is, but except to say that it features diners. The characters like frequently travel to diners in their journeys from assignment to assignment. And every diner, you have these four questions that the players answer. I just assign one question per player. And I think that those questions for the diners actually work really, really great in the tavern context to invite the players to sort of give you that texture, to give you that culture and lore of the space. So the questions are, what notable iconography or decor stands out to you? What special is featured on the menu? What quirky tavern tradition do the locals maintain here? That's a great way of painting the environment. What rumor have you heard about the owner of this establishment? I love questions like that because it invites the players to create something that they are, by virtue of creating it, automatically invested in, (laughs) right? So if you want to kind of play around with that as a GM, you can. That's great, especially because it adds a little bit. It says there is a quirky, you know, tradition here. Just asking, what is it? A a similar one would be like, you know, you see somebody from your past who maybe you didn't, it's inconvenient to run into. Who is it? Something like that as well. Who is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think anytime you can get players at a player level, not a character level, at a player level involved in talking about a space, that's just another way of creating that texture and getting that buy-in from players i have some stuff i want to talk about like in terms of like specific types of scenarios that work great in taverns but do you have anything else you want to say about just like the texture or the environment of a tavern going off just kind of that last bit about kind of a quick advice if i were to without prep have to like run a tavern scenario and this doesn't work for everyone and it kind of only works for regular bar flies who have gone to a lot of bars is i will just try to think of a place that i've gone a lot And then I will kind of fantasize it a little bit. Mm, Um, That way I kind of have a layout in my mind and I can kind of think of where the bar is, where the the bathroom, who's sitting where, what the bartender's like. Now they're a tiefling instead of a human. And it's 
just a little bit it's it's yeah. low effort but that's kind of my quick and dirty tavern method no i love it i love it so at the top of this discussion i talked about how i i do think that it's good for the players to have something to do <laughs> in the tavern session apart from just arm wrestling contests and and getting drunk trouble at grog's presents a mystery and i think a mystery is a great approach a mystery scenario for a tavern or inn environment is terrific i think we've actually covered another one like that on this show another inn module where there was a mystery in it if i recall i don't remember the name of it but a mystery is great because there's not a lot of geography (laughs) in a tavern right you don't have a lot of space there's not many things to really from a sort of location standpoint there's not a lot of places to go and see even if you stretch it out to the surrounding village, you're still just limited to the 10 to 12 buildings in that village. And so you kind of need a scenario that rewards or otherwise focuses on granularity. And mysteries are great for that because when you're engaging with a mystery, you're engaging with the environment in a more granular way. You're not worried about how do I traverse this 50-foot corridor. You're worried about who left these dark soot smudge fingerprints on the doorknob. It's a different way you interact with the environment. And I think because of that, mysteries are particularly good. Also because they're quite social. Do you have any thoughts about what is a good activity to do in the tavern? I agree. Mysteries or also obviously finding rumors. That's a classic one. And you can usually have like a good rumor mm-hmm. table. But also just trying to like find somebody you want to hire. Yeah. Especially if you're trying to hire somebody some somebody CD for something. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, you know, a tavern is the place you're going to look. Yeah, and, and setting it up to where like they're not just like sitting there, but you have to like actually like engage with characters to find this person or to or maybe even do some little side quest or something. That's terrific. Fun conversation. Any other thoughts about taverns? Anything else you want to say before we move on? I think that covers pretty much all of it that I can't just fit into Barkeep on the Borderlands, <laughs> which has most of my tavern advice. Well, let's get to it then, to the next segment. Okay, it's the Companion Adventures, and here we're going to be doing a slightly different version of our segment. Because we have Warren here, we are going to talk about Barkeep on the Borderlands and the ongoing Barkeep Jam. So why don't we start first. For folks who are not aware of what it is, uh, what is Barkeep on the Borderlands? Barkeep on the Borderlands is an adventure module that I published last year with a lot of contributors that people would be aware of, like Gus L. I know you guys have reviewed his stuff on the Mm -hmm, um, this before. Uh, Zedek, who's done A Thousand Thousand Islands, Mm -hmm. Ben L., Luca Rayek. But basically, 20 different taverns that are all set in this Mardi Gras-like party environment. People are bar crawling. But there is kind of a central mystery. So the monarch has been poisoned, and the antidote has been lost somewhere among all the deliveries to the various pubs in anticipation for this week of parties which is called the the raves of chaos it's yeah, clearly nice. kind of playing off the the b2 keep on the borderlands in a playful way <laughs> right yeah either you could run the whole thing as one big bar crawling adventure which is kind of the intent but this kind of secondary back of my mind intent is these 20 bars or pubs you can just pull out and drop into any setting some of them are weirder mm-hmm. than others but they're all interesting and have kind of weird characters who can interact with your people and very sticky toyetic encounters i love that how much publishing had you done before this? And like, how did you get this idea? Like what made you want to write this? Before this, I had just put out like a a pamphlet trifold on itch. So really nothing. This was inspired mostly by like COVID in 2020. I just graduated. (laughs) Like, like so much of things. I I graduated from law school. So I was no longer because of COVID going out as much. I was not seeing people as often. I was also not playing D and D as often either. Mm -hmm. And so I missed both of those things. And so the idea to combine those grew very early, but then I also I was reading very critically Keep on the Borderlands. I have an old blog post that mm. a lot of people hate because it is slightly <laughs> critical of, of it. But yeah, yeah. so whenever those two kings kind of came in my mind and I came up with the pun, Barkeep on the Borderlands, the pun is what really solidified like, oh, I need to do this adventure. Let me tell you, I don't know if listeners understand how much good TTRPG publications develop out of a cool title or idea. But no, Barkeep on the Borderlands, it's immediately grabby, right? Like, it's immediately catchy. It's probably one of the, like, in my mind, in recent years especially, it's probably one of, like, the all-time great, like, titles of something, right? Because it just, it does so much from just, like, a sort of crass marketing standpoint, but also it does tell you what, you know, at least on some level, kind of what you're getting into. I'm curious, 
How did you find working with these OSR, old school luminary folks? Like, what was the process like? It was pretty smooth just because I was already friends with nearly all of them prior to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, it's it's hurting cats to get, you know, because there are, I think, 30 people all involved in terms of, like, yeah. artists and everything. Yeah. That level of coordination is just tough just in terms of anybody, but everybody mm-hmm. was super lovely. Um, and I was, I was glad that they all were able to, to work on it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Not to put you on the spot or to play favorites, but I'm curious, do you have a couple of these bars that you want to call out, like that people might be interested in? Or One of my favorites is uh, Granny's Cottage, just because it's kind of an unusual one. It's not your typical bar. It's a little cottage made of candy in the middle of the woods run by a witch. And there's obvious kind of like hints that maybe she's kidnapping and, and cooking children like a fairy tale witch, <laughs> but nothing, yeah, nothing, you can't prove it. Another one is called Someone's Apartment, which isn't actually a pub. It's somebody's apartment that was left unlocked and it's like turned into a week long party. Oh, nice. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. That's awesome. Well, we also talked about the top barkeep jam, which is ongoing. We'll get into the dates and and mechanics of it here in a bit. But I love this idea, though, because something that we do in the gauntlet with our games is we have a really, really like active and we try to encourage a really active creative community around our games. We do writing contests, but also... We have fans of public access that are on their second <laughs> public access jam now, right? That they just did on them on their own, which is great. I think this is a really, really cool approach for getting people excited about not just barkeep, but also like getting excited about creating in a fairly low stakes way. So, what is the barkeep jam, and uh, what's what's going on with it? So, the barkeep jam, um, yeah, it was inspired by a lot of people who have not made things who were like, I. It seems really easy to make a just two page spread just a, of a bar. That seems like a good entry point. And I was like, oh, well, then, yeah, I should let this, I should make this happen. So it's being run on itch, but there's also links on my blog, Prismatic Wasteland. Basically, people can make whatever they want. It can either fit into the established barkeep setting, like in that same city. It could just be another pub using the same format that I have. I did something a little unusual for adventures. You know, with with systems, often you'll see carved from Brindlewood, like various licenses that you have. This one has the same thing, but for an adventure. So I have my basic mechanics that are used for the pub crawl mm-hmm. mechanics. Those I've, yeah. I've licensed out so anybody can use them. Nice. You can use kind of the, the formatting of the tables and stuff to help people feel like they can make their own bars. But it doesn't have to be your own bar. You can make yeah. NPC tables. One person made a, a little dungeon you can kind of plug as a seller for any of the bars. Oh, nice. So yeah. it's yeah. pretty open format, but kind of low stakes. <laughs> Just a... A nice summer jam. And yeah, it ends August 14th. So people listening to this now have a little bit of time to uh, put something together and put it out. So August 14th is when it runs through. So by the time this releases, that's probably still at least a good month or so uh, for folks to participate, if not more. Where are people congregating and talking about it? And where are they submitting their stuff? Like what what are the sort of uh, logistics of this? So in terms of submitting it, there is an itch page. It's itch dot backslash jam backslash barkeep jam but in terms of talking about it i do have kind of a little discord mm-hmm. there's a link on my blog uh, prismatic wasteland so if you click on the little hamburger icon it one of the options should be a discord and, and people are previewing their things and i'm giving some feedback yeah. one person's doing one based on a waffle house which as a big waffle house fan i'm very excited for <laughs> show up at 3 a.m at that <laughs> dungeon and zero that far and see what happens yeah, yeah it's good you know, listeners, go check out both the Jam and Parkeep on the Borderlands if you're not aware of it. I'm sure you are. It's an award-winning, you know, adventure thing. Everybody, everybody seems to love it. We are big fans here at F O A B D H Q. Those long letters. <laughs> But this was a lot of fun talking about Trouble at Grogs with you and talking about Barkeep. Thanks so much for being on the show. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Where can folks find you online? Best place to find me is prismaticwasteland.com. That's my blog. I'm also on the various Twitter and Twitter alternatives. I think it's Prismatic Wastes or Prismatic Wasteland. That's my handle. I'm the ostrich guy. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, let's go back over with Tom. Okay, Tom, what did you think? Well, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. It's, a, it's an unnervingly good audition for uh, my job. Yeah, I thought so too. I was like, man, if we need to get Tom out of here for some reason, we've, we've got someone waiting in the wings. That's <laughs> no. how I always feel after these guest episodes. I'm like, gosh, what Tom and I do is not that special. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, it is special. We have a particular chemistry that our listeners love. Trouble at Grogs. 
really, really fun. Did you have a chance to actually look at the module? I've uh, I have briefly skimmed it because I was I was curious about some of the things that you guys mentioned in passing. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and read that. You're so right about those maps, for example. They're really cool and like, really good, right? School. Yeah, they're cool. I was yeah, yeah, I was really surprised by it actually. And I'd like to ask you about this because I think you have read a lot more issues of Dungeon Magazine than I have, which is <laughs> yeah. that when you sort of mentioned before that listen that. Trouble at Grog's is from an old Dungeon Magazine article. I'm not sure what I had in mind. I think I had a sort of classic village plus dungeon location adventure is what I was expecting. But is Trouble at Grog's, is it quite typical of what you would find in a classic era Dungeon Magazine scenario? I have read a lot of Dungeon Magazine scenarios, and I have to say they are quite varied. I think that it would be unfair to say that there is a typical Dungeon Magazine scenario. I don't know if I've ever offhandedly characterize them that way or not Mm. before, but I don't think they are. For example, I'm actually getting ready to run the very first dungeon ever published in Dungeon Magazine. I think it's called the Dark Tower of Kabbalah or something like that. And it's really, really quite different from Trouble at Grog's. And if you kind of go through that haunted house scenario that we love so much, that's from Dungeon Magazine. I've read dozens of these. And yeah, I would say the variety is really high. And I have a feeling why that's the case. I think that Dungeon Magazine was the space where TSR were a little bit more unfettered. That makes sense, yeah. They were quasi-official publications, and I think that the TSR folk were more inclined to take chances in Dungeon Magazine than maybe they would in their in their regular modules. Yeah, because if it doesn't work out, then it's not yeah, it's not TSR. <laughs> exactly. They just say hey, they yeah, give right, this guy's yeah, exactly. a chance and yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's really, really nice. I'm also, I think it's interesting though, because is this issue like what four? Of Number the, four. Yeah. So it's very early, and yet already, and I think this is a borderline criticism I'm about to do. Is I think it's we're already seeing that slightly second order fantasy thing where it's already commenting on the tropes of Dungeons and Dragons, like the go with it. Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> I am not sure if I'm super on board for the kind of fantasy setting where you do a scam by miraculously healing someone with the divine power of the gods instead of just <laughs> making medicine but th- but it seems I so well executed it. I you know it's yeah, so yeah. good yeah yeah, yeah yeah no it was it's good i get what you're saying though i think this would have been what 1987 mm. i think when this issue came yeah, so it's out it's not that early in D is it it's it, but it's not no D has been around a minute yeah yeah, yeah. And so it, it was really fun. What do you think about the actual like tavern discussion? I'd be curious to get your thoughts on. Oh on yeah, well, adventures. I mean, I'm a I'm a big fan of a, a tavern adventure, but when I've done them, they're usually not in this sort of the classic fantasy adventure mold. It would normally be something more story gamey, you know, like drama system mm-hmm. and the sort of per- yeah. personal yeah. plots. Or I remembered one of the example adventures in Over the Edge back in the day was basically just two paragraphs saying, why don't you all go out and get drunk on the island? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really into that sort of freeform personality-based adventure. And I think it's really interesting and very practical as well, which is the best kind of discussion that you, to have where you guys were talking about how to make that work within this sort of milieu of adventurers who presumably are not going to do this for your whole campaign, maybe. And they right. still find it interesting yeah. and used to have the social dungeon or the... Uh, well, we can't call it a pub crawl because that's a different thing, isn't it? But the uh, tavern crawl, let's say. like I think that's quite interesting. Although Grog's is very nearly a pub crawl, right? Because it's got, <laughs> yeah. it like prominently features three taverns. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting consideration. One of the things that I thought about after we recorded with Warren, one of the things that occurred to me is thinking about like a tavern as like a scenario space or adventuring space really does require you to sort of unpack your thinking about what it means to be a fantasy adventuring party altogether and like what the players are actually doing in the moment you know when i talked about like okay there should be some sort of activity that the characters are doing and i always settle on mysteries when it comes to taverns because i think that because the granularity of a mystery invest you know sort of investigation like works well in a space that is otherwise not that big geographically speaking or space wise but I, i think what i was really kind of getting at in that is you have to kind of think about the tavern. You almost have to like treat it as a design constraint. You know, you have yeah, to, you have to yeah. think about it like as as a design constraint. And how can you change the game you're playing, or how can you alter and challenge the basic assumptions of what that game intends you to be doing in order to make the tavern space fun? 
it occurs to me that the main thing I've uh, used a tavern or, or, in our case, a coffee house for in the ongoing DCC campaign I run is that it's a place where there is a sort of an adventure or a, a story bit happening mm-hmm. quite often, but it's always just at the beginning or the end or some interstitial part. And so it develops quite slowly, but they have this rival adventuring party who basically are a great motivator because they just show up and mock the PCs for being <laughs> rubbish, right, yeah, or so yeah. they say. But every so often it does build up into a flashpoint mm-hmm. where they decide to confront Douglas and his goons. And uh, <laughs> Oh, Douglas. <laughs> yeah, it's that, Douglas. But that's actually, that has worked really well. I think that's a that sort of slow pace of it, like where it, mm. it gradually develops. But you don't have to worry about it too much. Having said that, it, I do feel like my cafe setting is a bit thin and it is because there's not enough people in it we've got like vaguely got mm. douglas and we've got the rivals we've got the proprietor who never really gets a name but there's no one else and i think i want like the cast of amelie or something in there to you know <laughs> to hang out with just sometimes that would be good yeah. so i'm gonna work yeah, on that in future yeah. so yeah <laughs> i love it well I think that's going to be our episode for today, listeners. Fear of a Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at GauntletRPG. Our website is gauntlet-rpg.com or brindlewoodbay.com if you prefer. And um, we're on Patreon as well. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon, it's patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. You can also support the show by leaving a five-star review on this episode or any of the episodes. And writing a review is really nice too. So... <laughs> With all that said, uh, Tom, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jason. Thanks to our excellent guest, Warren. Mm-hmm. Thanks as ever to our intoxicating editor, Rich Rogers. And thank you, listeners, for listening. We'll catch you later. Take care.